Okay, let's talk about now power and energy flow in an electromagnetic wave. So let's go back to our units for a second. We've got electric field, which has units of volts per meter. And we have magnetic field, which has units of amps per meter. So notice what happens if we multiply them together. We do something like E times H, electric field times magnetic field. The units of that would be volts times amp divided by meters times meters or volt amps per meter squared. Now we actually know what volt times amp is. That's equal V times I, right? And we know that P equals VI. If you take a voltage and you multiply it by current, you get a power. And so let's write this actually as watts per meter squared. So there's a hint of, uh, uh, of where we're going to go. We, we, we probably are going to have to multiply the electric field and magnetic field together. And we're going to get a quantity, which is an energy density. It's an energy per unit area. So if you have a, a radio wave that's passing through your screen right now, and you open up a little window, and you let everything through that window, you might ask the question, how much power is passing through that window? How many uh, how many joules per second is passing through that window? The answer is, well, take how big your window is, and there's going to be an energy density associated with that. The bigger your window is, the more power you're allowing through. And E times H is telling us the energy density. For every meter squared of window, we're allowing that many watts through it. And so the actual formal definition of this is represented by something called the pointing vector. And the pointing vector is, again, a vector, which we're going to represent with S. And S will work out to be E, the electric field, cross with H. Now, this is going to do two things. The first is it's going to multiply the intensity of E by the intensity of H. And that, we know, it ought to give us units of power per unit meter, per unit square meter, per unit area. And so that's helpful. But the other thing is the direction is going to matter because you also know that the electric field cross with the magnetic field is going to point in the direction of propagation. So this both has an amplitude that's equal to the power flow or the power flow density. We also know that it points in the direction that that power is flowing. Now this pointing vector, as I've defined it here, S equals E cross H, this is correct in the time domain, meaning not in the phasor form. In the phasor domain, when you're dealing with one frequency and you have approached everything as if it's a phasor, uh, it's a little bit more complicated because we've got electric fields and we've got magnetic fields. And you think about what E cross H is, it's sort of varying rapidly. Uh, it's basically the multiplication of these two sine waves, and so it's going to vary a lot. And so the actual uh, pointing vector for a time harmonic wave where sinusoidally varying is generally done with the, um, the time average of the power. And that's usually written with uh, brackets here around the vector s. This is a way of representing the time average. And if you remember, if you take a square wave and figure out its RMS value, which means you square it, um, calculate the average and take the square root of that, we call that RMS or root mean squared, it's about 0.7 times what the peak value is. So if you have a sinusoid, it's got a one volt amplitude, it's got a power level or an average RMS value of 0.707. And so for that reason, this is gonna end up being the following. It's gonna be one half times the real part of the electric field cross with the complex conjugates of the, of the magnetic field. And remember, these are phasors right here, right? And this S over here is the time averaged pointing flux, or if you like, it's the RMS power flow. And this star right here is what we call the complex conjugates.
Simply put, the complex conjugate is what happens when we take a complex number, right? So if we have the number C, which equals alpha plus J beta, then the complex conjugate C star will equal to alpha minus J beta. In other words, we take the imaginary component of whatever number we're dealing with and multiply it by negative one, and that's a complex conjugate. Well, it's really just flipping the sign of something in the complex plane, All right? Now we can do a little bit more with this because we also have a relationship between the electric field and the magnetic field, in particular, that the intensity of the electric field divided by the intensity of the magnetic field for a uniform plane wave equals eta, which also equals the square root of mu divided by epsilon. All right, if we take this and plug it into E cross H, then we can also figure out, since E is perpendicular to H, the electric field and magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, we can also say that the time average pointing vector works out to be one over twice the uh, intrinsic impedance times the intensity of the electric field squared. Or you can repeat the same thing for magnetic field and it would be eta divided by two times the intensity of the magnetic field squared. And again, these are phasors right here since it's a phasor form that we're dealing with. So this is a more convenient way to figure out what is the time average power flow if we know either the electric field and the magnetic field and we know something about the material through which this is propagating, which gives us eta. So these two are the same and they will give you the same answer for any given example of a plane wave passing through um, some medium. Now let's talk a little bit about energy storage as a result. We have this notion of a wave as being a transfer of energy from one form to another and back and forth. Uh, for example, in the transmission lines, it was a transfer of voltage to current and then current back to voltage, energy was stored in a capacitor, and then that capacitive energy was transferred into being stored in an inductor, and then was transferred back to the next capacitor, and so on and so forth. And so let's take a look at how these relate to each other. Uh, we have this idea from an older lecture that one half times epsilon times the intensity of E squared represents the energy stored in the electric field, or the energy density. that the existence of the electric field itself will by definition means that there's stored energy. There's a stored potential. I can plop an electron in the middle of that electric field and it's going to be accelerated. So that represents an energy that's stored in the electric field. Let's replace the E with an eta times H since we know that E and H relate to each other. So this is one half times epsilon times eta H squared now we're going to expand this. This is one half times eta squared epsilon over two times h squared. And now since eta equals, since eta squared equals mu over epsilon, let's plug that in. This works out to be one half times mu times the intensity of h squared. And look at this. We basically have started out with the energy density in the electric field, applied only the idea that we have an intrinsic impedance between the electric field and the magnetic field. And with that alone, we have gotten ourselves to the exact same relationship as the energy density in the magnetic field. The lesson here is that the same way that we had an equal amount of energy shifting from capacitor to inductor and back to capacitor in a transmission line, in a radio wave, we're doing the same thing except it's the field lines that are storing it. It's the electric field storing energy, which then by Maxwell's equations, that energy moves into being stored in magnetic fields. And then via Maxwell's equations, it comes back into being stored in electric fields and so on and so forth. And that is how an electromagnetic wave propagates. Uh, the same, by the way, can be said true for simple circuit elements. And so if we start out with one half C times V squared, which represents the energy stored in a capacitor. And then we apply the same relationship, one half times C times Z0I squared. Since in any 
transmission line, the intrinsic impedance Z0 is the ratio of the voltage to the current. And now we're gonna pull out the Z0 squared and make this one half times Z0 squared C times I squared. But of course, Z0 squared equals L over C. So plug that in uh, into here. And this will be one half times L times I squared. And that is the energy stored in an inductor. So this basically just uh, reconfirms our thinking about how a transmission line was really working all along. That while we represented it as voltages and currents, what was really happening was that the voltages were creating electric fields inside the transmission line and the currents were creating magnetic fields. And those uh, energy storage in the electric fields and magnetic fields, we were going back and forth between them via Maxwell's equations. The voltages and currents were simply byproducts of that. And we can see that by the exact same mirroring relationship between the, the uh, energy that's stored in capacitors and inductors and the energy that's stored in electric fields and magnetic fields. So hopefully that closes the, um, uh, the circle and, and the picture on uh, how a transmission line can really be seen as a guide of electromagnetic waves or any circuit device with a voltage or a current on it is a guide of electromagnetic waves, not strictly um, a voltage carrier on its own. But you've got to look underneath the hood and you've got to look at this from the electric field and magnetic field perspective in order to see that. In the coming lectures, we're going to be expanding on this and looking more at different types of radio waves. And we're going to start to address how they interact with other materials. Um, and so we can close this uh, um, section here um, with a lot of new information about radio waves and how they propagate.